The first is Mushan Zeraviv, who's a designer, activist, and also an artist whose works are now being displayed in our exhibition at the Design Museum. And Mushan is going to talk about his work normalizing machine, art, and algorithms. Mushan. Hi, um, let's start this here. Okay, so I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to be a part of this year's uh, uh, print screen. Um, and it's always very exciting to, to see how um, both the festival and the community evolves from year to year. Um, the previous uh, talk and, and film spoke about uh, where uh, di digital art is right now and uh, uh, this discussion of the post-digital. Um, post I think it's really important to put, uh, to put the things in historical perspective and that's something that I'm going to do now um, with my talk about, um, about the normalizing machine. So post-digital, pre-digital, uh, I, I think what, what's good about the post-digital is that it puts um, digital aesthetics and uh, digital life in, uh, in, um, in a historical context. And, and most of my talk would talk about the history that got us to, to the digital and how to um, reflect on that in a way. So, as always, um, everything is separated to three things, so this talk as well. Um, I'll talk about criminali criminalizing the face algorithmic normalization, and then simple AI. So, criminalizing the face. Let's go back to Paris uh, around the late 1800s. Back then, um, the police used to... Um, it, it, this is the, be the beginning of uh, photography. Um, the police started to use photographs to, uh, to um, take photographs of criminals and to try to understand like who who's standing in front of me, okay? Um, and they had a problem, because uh, even though they started uh, taking these photographs, you didn't have photographic IDs yet. So uh, this criminal, you might catch, catch this criminal, um, and he may say his name is Philippe Trejoli, or uh, some other a mock name in France, in French, in, uh, but his, uh, but he, he is actually, Ravakol, the, the very um, notorious anarchist uh, terrorist in, uh, in Paris and um, to be able to actually um, to, be, uh, to, to know that this person who is who he is, um, a new system had to be developed. And that system was developed by um, Alphonse Bertillon. <coughs> Bertillon was uh, the son of a statistician and he was a police officer in, in Paris. And he understood that he can't really deal with all of these pictures because uh, the pictures, there's no way of indexing them. And he understood that he needs to standardize them. So he, he decided that photographs of, of anyone who gets arrested should be taken like this. One from the front and one from the side. And you all know that because this is the mugshot. So he's the, the inventor of the mugshot. And think about it. As soon as you see two pictures like that, you already know it's a criminal. Right? This is the image of criminality. And he didn't stop there. He continued by um, taking some measures and, uh, and creating the whole framework for understanding how to document um, arrests, um, specifically uh, photographic documentation. His system uh, included, included new devices for measuring the body. So, you, you can see measuring uh, the head, measuring ears, measuring the hand. Every aspect is measured and quantified. Okay, so we have numbers ne next to what we used to think about as just faces and bodies. And, and he, he went along to, to uh, he focused on the face and he created uh, this tableau synoptique des traits uh, physionomique. What he, uh, he was focusing on is the portrait parlé. Portrait parlé, the speaking portrait. 
So the portrait is speaking to us now. There's a way for, to understand what the portrait says, not what the person says. Okay? And, and this is broken to um, noses, right? Different types of noses. How each one he gave, he gave a letter to, and he created an index, right? Of noses, of mouths, of eyes, a lot of eyes. Each one can be it can now be indexed, and he really, really liked ears. A lot of ears. Um, he kind of sunk into the ear in a way, um, and and now for him this was an indexing system, a very powerful indexing system, and as as an indexing indexing system, it was also very uh, po popularized. Um, this is the way he separated. Um, the different parts of the of the face, and it became really popular. It was studied uh, all around the world, and this has become the way to um, to photograph arrests and to, the way to index and and uh, retrieve photographs from that archive. Uh, at least for a few years until this invention was made. Um, so um, it was less than ten years before uh, fingerprints would uh, completely. Um, replace the Berti, the, the Bertillonage, the, the system that he created. But it wasn't the end of that system, because this guy, Francis Galton, was very excited about this invention. He he was so Francis, Francis Galton was um, was uh, the cousin of Darwin, and he was very excited about about Darwin's theories, uh, especially natural selection. This idea of natural selection was an inspiration for him, um, for uh, the eugenics, the eugenics movement. What was the eugenics movement about? It, it saw uh, Darwinism as a recipe, like how do you create better people? You don't just look at, at history and, and um, evolution, you create evolution. And how do you do that? Uh, you, the, the eugenics society was kind of a prescription for how to recreate. They would run um, contests for the perfect family. So you needed to be uh, examined exactly with Bertillon's uh, um, tools and systems to see if, if you are perfect uh, physically, especially, and, and if you're not perfect, uh, even if uh, you have a um, a basic uh, um, uh, defect in your in your lip, then um, you should not be rec uh, you should not be allowed to to recreate, and th and this is something that was this whole movement was very very uh, popular, <coughs> both in Europe and in uh, in America. Some people are born to be a burden on the rest, right? Um, so they actually conducted had laws against allowing people like that defects. To continue in, to continue into evolution, um, and as you know, um, there were other people excited about uh, these technologies uh, and, and these concepts. Uh, and the translation is here: this person suffering from from heredity defect uh, cost the, the community sixty thousand Reichmarks during his lifetime. F fellow German, that is your money too. So the way to, to get rid of that is to document it and make sure that these kind of people don't get to recreate. Um, when Bertillon was asked about that, he, he said, I, I do not feel convinced that, that it is the lack of, of symmetry in the visage, visage or, or the size of the orbit or the shape of the jaw which makes a man an evildoer. He, was, he saw it as an indexing system, but you know, as every artist knows, uh, what you think about your art is not what other people may, may think about it. So, act two, algorithmic normalization. Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a pioneer uh, of computing. He invented computer science, and in World War II, he was w one of the leading um, scientists who cracked the Enigma machine, the, the Nazi Enigma machine. Same approach. Uh, the Enigma machine was, it, they found a way of indexing and finding the index of the Enigma machine. But Turing took it a, a step further. And in 1950, he published a volume. I propose to consider the question can machines. Um, can
can we get some more volume? Again? And in 1950, he published a prophetic essay. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? This should begin with definitions of the meaning of the terms machine and think. The definitions might be framed so as to reflect as far as possible the normal use of the words. But this attitude is dangerous. So he invented the Turing test that until today is kind of uh, the frontier for, um, for artificial intelligence. For an artificial intelligence to pass the Turing test, it needs to fool a human. That the human needs to think that they're speaking to, a, to another human while they're actually speaking to a, to a machine. Uh, but Turing was also a homosexual in the, in the 50s, which was not something you're supposed to be. Um, and in the 50s, after World War II, um, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't allowed to speak about the work that he did in World War II, uh, saving millions of lives. Um, but, and he was uh, convicted of homosexuality and was chemically castrated uh, until in 1954, he took his own life by eating a cyanide-laced apple. Um, in his writing, he speaks about, uh, about, um, about what he imagines to be a, a child machine, speaking about teaching that machine, right? And, and he was concerned about it will, it will be possible to, to apply exactly the same teaching process to the machine as to a normal child. But he was concerned that other children would make fun of that child. And, and what kind of empathy would that child uh, win when that child is a machine? And, and indeed, uh, this is a study that was published just last year that, that showed that um, neural networks, uh, artificial intelligence systems, um, can identify gay men with 91% detection accuracy and, and gay women with 83% accuracy. So, if it, what happened is exactly the opposite of what Turing was uh, imagining. He was imagining to, that the machine would be subjected by, by the systemic bias of society, but the system has become the vehicle and the amplification of society's uh, biases. A startup company based in Tel Aviv says it has developed software that can identify terrorists and other criminals based on their facial features. Faceception's learning algorithm program uses 15 classifiers and genetics to uncover an individual's personality traits. We see many uh, uh, signals in the face which are coded from the DNA and this is a way we can make analysis or personalization of anyone. Anyone. Um, so machine so lo looking at human, first we have face detection that means oh that there's a face in that picture, uh, or uh, my camera detects a face. Um, there's face recognition. We know who that face is. That's what um, Bertillon was interested in. And then there's face analysis. This is what faceception is interested in. Um, to, to look at the, this person to say, I don't necessarily know who this person, but they look dangerous, or they look okay. But when we think about it, humans are the same, right? When we're looking at, the, at someone, we're saying, oh, I see a face. And face recognition means I recognize this face. And when we see uh, someone that we don't know, we automatically do the, uh, a very similar pattern recognition and say, this is a normal face. There's nothing wrong with this face. Or there is something kind of suspicious about this face. So what is the difference, basically? Why are we concerned about the machine vision when it comes to face recognition and face analysis? Well, we have eyes, and when we look at people who have eyes and, we, and have faces, we also have faces. We are faces looking at faces. Even when we're looking at pictures, we're looking at them through our eyes that are in our face. So even if we're holding someone by force and making them take a picture because they, we think they've done something wrong, wrong we, the, above, this, uh, above what, what this picture is cut, there is a face. And, and there is human uh, relationship, even, even if it's antagonistic. Up. 
I was not supposed to do that. And this thing does not have a face. And when it doesn't have a face, the vision is completely different. And the relationship is completely different. The empathy is completely different, or rather, does not exist. Sinful AI. What do we mean by that? Uh, Foucault said that if you are not like everyone, everybody else, then you are abnormal. If you are abnormal, then you are sick. Um, that, that is the perception of abnormality. And indeed, um, we, we now see uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence used to criminalize uh, in the criminal uh, justice system as a way of saying uh, this person is, um, uh, should get a parole, this person should, should not get a parole. They're not making the judgment, but they are what's called decision supportive system. So they help a judge decide whether to give someone a parole or not. And as any technology, they're not accurate. Um, the normalizing machine is an attempt to reflect on that and to allow you how to, to, to experiment how do, we, how do you teach a machine, but to actually be there in person, actually to be there while with your body and your face when you're teaching that machine. The way it works is that you're asked to point at the, most, uh, the more normal of the two, and this is something you can check later in the museum. And then when you find the more normal, then they get a point. You continue like that until you uh, ha have to choose between yourself and the most normal person uh, that you've seen. And then uh, your image is uh, is added to a database. Uh, we actually uh, put you in a database uh, very much inspired by uh, Bertillon's uh, system. We calculate um, your, your facial features and then we add you uh, through an algorithm to, to Bertillon's uh, um, ta table. We find what kind of uh, a, a forehead do you have, does it fit within other foreheads that we've seen, and what aggregated number uh, of scale of normality did they, did they get. Um, so this is a picture from uh, the installation, and we can see, uh, we can see this chart here. Um, and these are some of the people that uh, contributed to our research, so we want to say thank you, but uh, I was very excited when someone said, I don't want to be a part of this. And, and this, is, this is the kind of response that I hoped for. I don't think we should want to be a part of it, even though you get a very nice uh, picture for Instagram later. Um, but can we allow ourselves not to be a part of this? Like, um, in Tinder, we're a part of this. In Facebook, we're a part of this. In Instagram, we're a part of this. Basically, every click or swipe that we do creates an image of normalization or abnormality. So, do we have an option there? Do we have an option to get outside of that system? Um, yes, uh, there are beginnings of, of, of options. Um, we can talk about transparency. So, so transpar we can be more transparent with the way algorithms work, and these are, these are some, some rules uh, that, uh, that can be conducted for transparency, and some of you, many of you have gotten many emails having to do with GDPR. GDPR is, is, is rules of the U European Union. European Union actually uh, demanded uh, that at least the, th the th three of these would be um, uh, respected, and that's why a, a few months ago you got a lot of emails from a lot of services asking you for permission, right? You didn't get uh, really understand what this permission was about, and that's why transparency is not enough. It's not enough to know. It's also important to, to actually hold algorithms accountable. And the very interesting uh, research that just came out, and I'll, I'm about to finish with this, um, it speaks about counterfactual um, explanations for, um, for machine learning. So you don't have to expose how your um, algorithm works, but, you should, uh, but, but we should be able to run different, um, different uh, uh, color, body colors, uh, different uh, sexes, different ages, 
the, the different uh, uh, upbringings and see if it creates bias. And if it does create bias, then there's something wrong with the algorithm. So, so there are ways for, for demanding more algorithmic um, accountability and, and this is definitely something that is being uh, conducted and researched right now. So to finish, the abnormal, while logically second, is existentially first. We first identify what's not normal. And that's why uh, the prompt in, in our work is asking you to, to point at the one who's more normal. What you're actually doing is finding abnormality in the other. So it's, it's not a seamless um, experience, it's sinful. We want to expose the seams. We want to show you that technology has uh, flaws and the technological process uh, a part of it. So post-digital, post pre-digital, it is in the context of history and it's important to see it that way. So thank you very much.